morning. Good morning, church. My name is Jane Richter, and I get the privilege and the honor to welcome you all here this morning. So thank you for joining us. This is the North Region of the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ. That is in Um We are made up of four regions for those of us who are visiting uh, this morning with us. Um, four regions, most of them aptly named after the location that they're geographically based in. So for example, we have a church in South Jersey, and it's called the South Jersey region. <laughs> and we have a church in Chestnut Hill, and it's called Chestnut Hill. And we have a church in Havertown called the Havertown region. And then there's us. We're just known as the North. We are geographically north of all those other regions, even though there is a church north of us called the Lehigh Valley Church, um, located in Lehigh Valley. So, but although we have churches kind of throughout the um, state of PA, we have sister churches um, all over Pennsylvania, we have sister churches all over uh, the U.S., and uh, we also have sister churches throughout the world. And that's what I wanted to share a little bit about. Um, I had the privilege four years ago, stepping out on faith, doing something a little bit outside my comfort zone, and going to on a mission trip to visit a church in Kathmandu, Nepal. I have never been like east of New York City, so for, <laughs> for me to go as far as Kathmandu, Nepal was a major leap of faith, and God completely it. I met some absolutely amazing people. Um, we went there to serve the church and to meet our brothers and sisters. Kind of felt like I was kind of living out the book of Acts. We got to visit the homes of disciples throughout Kathmandu. I actually got to go on a trek. I think we did about 20 miles, which was huge for me. Pushed myself a little bit. Um, but it was a transformative experience. I was so amazingly blessed to go that um, about a year ago, when they said that we were going to be doing another mission trip, I signed up. I was like, when, where, I don't care. I want to go, I want to be a part of that. I want to be with our brothers and sisters throughout the world. And so about a week ago, uh, Monday actually, a group of us uh, came back from visiting the Delhi church. So we got to spend 10 amazing days with our brothers and sisters in, the, uh, in Delhi, India, no longer called New Delhi, I learned that. Um, and we got the opportunity to serve in, oh, well, I served specifically in an orphanage, and that was just a warm, encouraging experience just holding the babies. Delhi's a very, very busy city. I mean, I grew up outside of New York, lots of traffic, it was very busy. We can't light a candle to Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> I, I rode the subways in New York, you can't light a candle, I mean, it was just, it was, I mean, that was just, busy, very, very busy, and so to have the opportunity to just sit and, and just hold babies, and they would, you know, wake up from their their nap, and I'd hold them, and then they'd fall asleep, and um, it was absolutely peaceful. I also got the opportunity to serve at a school, a primary school, and um, I was there to kind of teach and educate and do crafts with them, but I learned so much more from them than, you know, they could ever learn from me, and it was really amazing, um, and so for our guests that were visiting, no matter what region you visit or, or whatever church you visit, there's always this energy that you feel in our fellowship. This joy, we're glad to be together. Yeah. To call to order for us to start service is, is a chore. Um, <laughs> I don't know, Evan and Walter do it gracefully. Um, but we just love sharing and talking and being with one another. And I feel that that is due to the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit just moving and flowing. Um, between us, and so when we have an opportunity to visit a sister church here in PA or in the US or in another country, even if you don't speak the language, you really feel that energy, you really feel the Holy Spirit. And I'm so grateful for that gift that God has given us and deposited in each one of us that say Jesus is the Lord. So I wanted to share a scripture with you guys. Amen. Uh, Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, 
then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and one of mind. And so I want to leave you guys with that this morning, and thank you all for being in here, and especially thank our friends and guests that are visiting this morning. Welcome. Good morning. Again, I'd like to welcome everybody. It's just great to see everybody here today. I uh, had the privilege of uh, taking us uh, to the communion portion of our, our message today to really reflect on the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're en entering into the uh, time of Thanksgiving. How many people are excited about turkey? Yeah, yeah we, we got it ordered, we're gonna get everything ready. So uh, it's a fun time, isn't it? To be able to spend time with friends and family and just really reflect on everything to be, that we're thankful for. There's so many things that we're thankful for, right? I'm very thankful for all of you. I always feel like I'm with my family here. This is like a, a Thanksgiving day every Sunday because I have a chance to come and spend time with my brothers and sisters. It just brings a lot of joy and peace to me. I hope you feel the same. I love the energy today and I just, uh, I love all of you. I also want to thank all those who wish me happy birthday. We have a lot of birthdays in November. I didn't realize it. They're popping up everywhere. We have some exciting things happen. Um, Maria just had her baby. I don't know where Anne is. You may be familiar with that. If you want to see pictures, go see Donna. She has them. So, beautiful little girl. And uh, so a lot of exciting things happening. So when I really think about thankfulness, you know, I, I was reflecting on uh, a particular scripture. It's a parable that Jesus um, was presenting to those who were listening to him. Uh, it's in Luke 15, verse 3. And it says, then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. You know, when I think of this passage, all too often I forget this. I don't know about you. Sometimes I forget that God really cares about me and really does want to seek me out and pursue me. There's a song that is sung by a Christian artist called Reckless Love. And many of you maybe have heard this song before. And um, since I've been spending a lot of time commuting to and from work over the past 18 months, I listen to a lot of Christian music and I pray a lot and I sing a lot. And every now and then you get one of those songs that you've heard over and over again that really strikes you. It really penetrates your thoughts, your mind, your spirit. And when I really think about this song, it, he talks about all the obstacles that God is removing to get to you. You as an individual, not as a group, not, as, not, not being in with other people, but you individually. It says, you know, that he will chase us down. There won't be a shadow that he won't light up. There won't be a mountain that he won't climb to get to us. There won't be a wall that he won't kick down to get to us. There won't be a lie that he won't tear down. This is really powerful, but sometimes I really forget how much God really wants to pursue an individual relationship with me and, and how much he cares for me personally. And sometimes it's really hard for me to even accept that he would even want to have this relationship with me. Especially when I, I fail, when I fall down, or I make a mistake, or I continue to sin in a particular area in my life. You know, you get to a point, you, you, you start listening to yourself and saying, I'm not worthy. That, you know, he doesn't really care. Like, how could he want to have a relationship with me? Because I keep messing up. The good news is, he wants that relationship with us. He died on the cross and, and was resurrected so we could have this relationship with him. And this is a time of the service that we can reflect on that. 
And if you're in a, if you're in a place right now where you don't feel that you're worthy of his love and his forgiveness, let me share with you, he wants to give that to you. He wants to give it to you. He cares for you individually. There's nothing that you can do that's, not, that's going to make him not pursue you and want to have that individual relationship with you. The only response that we have to make is accepting this gift and realizing that it's a promise that we can hold on to and believe in. So as you, we go and reflect on the death of Christ, but then the resurrection and, the re and what we have in him, keep hold on to those things. Don't listen to the lies that Satan tries to put in your way when you're trying to you know, go through this, you know, am, I, am I worthy, am I not worthy? You are worthy. God loves you and wants to have a personal relationship with you. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I just uh, thank you so much for this time. I thank you, Father, for sending your son to come down, uh, to die on the cross and be resurrected, to be in human form, to, to really experience all the things that we experience, Father, that, that there is a Father that you know exactly what we go through every day. Father, I thank you for forgiving us and, and washing us uh, clean, Father, that we can come to you at this point in time. Father, I pray that you would just continue to love us and we could feel your love and that we also can just uh, feel your spirit that lives within us to be able to live a life that's um, really pleasing to you and to others. In Jesus' name. Good morning, good morning. How are we doing? Good. What a service it's been so far. It is great to see everyone. I'll get my setup here. I'd like to hold the mic. Six mic on. Hope they can tell the sound team. Sorry about that. All right. All right here. How are we doing? Good. It's great to see everyone as always. Uh, great to see uh, you guys. I don't see. Terrence and Roxana, that's too bad, but they did uh, have a wedding this weekend. Let's give it up. Happy for them, celebrating the happy couple. We cheer from afar. I know a lot of you guys were there, so that's encouraging. Uh, yeah, like Dave said, a lot of great news happening. Um, as you can see, the Evanses are away today. That's not the good news, but they are visiting family, and as was mentioned, uh, their daughter Maria and her husband Chance did have their baby. Uh, and it was a healthy delivery, so that is wonderful news. I also can see that we have a little more different people here in the audience uh, today. Uh, I see a handful of people from Chestnut Hill region. So uh, welcome, welcome, thankful that you guys are joining us today. Um, you know, the lesson today, we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Hebrews. We've been going through the book of Hebrews together, and we are now in chapter 9. If you want to turn to chapter 9. And that's what we'll be. You know, this chapter specifically furthers, is going to further the comparison between the old and new covenants discussed in chapter 8. Walter did a great job last week talking about chapter 8, introducing the Old and New Testaments. Now, there's two significant ways that the author here in Hebrews has been comparing the Testaments. And as we've been going about these series, one of the significant ways is the greatness of Christ. Amen. That's kind of been our overarching theme. That Jesus is just simply better. Jesus is just better than the prophets, than the angels, than Moses and Joshua, than Aaron and the priesthood. Jesus is just better than them all. But then there's also a significant way the author mentions in this book, as we've been starting to touch on from last chapter, is not only that Jesus is great, but there is a greatness about the new covenant. And what is the new covenant? That is the New Testament. That is the law that we follow today, that Jesus brought forth for us. A better promise, as Walter talked about last week. But this morning in chapter 9, what are we going to talk about is we'll see our attention is now drawn to a better sanctuary. A better sanctuary provided by what? The New Testament, the New Covenant. And so I wanted to ask you guys a question. I just wanted to get some engagement a little bit. Is that all right? When you think about the word sanctuary, what do you think about? What comes to your mind? Just cast them out. A safe place. A holy place. 
Amen. Come to mind from the sanctuary. Peace. Peace. A peaceful place. Serenity. No judgment. No judgment in the sanctuary. Connection with God. Connection with God. Amen. You guys are spiritual. I love that. That's a very spiritual answers. I was thinking for like, you know, maybe like man cave that you have in the basement, things like that. They're earthly sanctuaries. But you guys know what we're here for. But yes, absolutely, this 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 sacredness, this peace, right? This this freedom from judgment, this place of refuge and protection. But I think, as we'll see here in chapter nine, to really appreciate this truth of a better sanctuary, we've got to look at the earthly sanctuaries. But we've got to be acquainted specifically with the earthly sanctuary of the first covenant, of the Old Testament. And so we're going to read about that as the author explains here in verse 1 through verse 10. You guys with me? Let's hop in here in verse 1 in chapter 9. The author says, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. And in its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. And behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. And this Ark contained the gold jar of manna and Aaron's staff that had budded and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Now above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. And then in verse 6, When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifice being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Wow. Wow. Some great detail of this tabernacle, of this earthly sanctuary that God ordained to be built for the children of Moses, for the people of Israel, a material earthly sanctuary, as we see here in the bottom left, my, your left, whatever, the earthly tabernacle. It was a, it was a, it was a big tent, you could imagine, but, but not too huge. In fact, I feel like it would fit in this room, this earthly tabernacle, this tent. It wasn't particularly large, but it did have, as the Bible said, two separate rooms. All right. Now, the first room was called the holy place. This room was the larger of the two rooms in the tabernacle, and it's where the priests would enter daily. But then there was this second room, this smaller room in the tabernacle called the most holy of holies, or the most holy place. And that was the smaller part that was behind this veil that you could not enter unless you're the high priest. Now, what does the scripture say was inside the first room, inside the holy place? Well, in there, you would find something like a lampstand. You would find this lampstand made of gold and had seven lamps for burning olive oil, and it was meant to illuminate and bring light. In fact, it was never allowed to go out. It was constantly supposed to bring light to the tent. But you would also find this table, again, in the first room. That would have this showbread, as it was called. And it's this gold table that had 12 loaves of bread on it that symbolized something. And what did it symbolize? It symbolized the fellowship God had with Israel. And on the Sabbath is when fresh loaves would be replaced. And the old bread would be eaten by the priests. But then you have the inner room. You have the second room behind the veil called the Holy of Holies. That was probably a third of the tent. And what was inside this? Well, you might find not a lampstand or a table, but a golden altar of incense or a golden censer. And this was incense that was offered upon it to symbolize something. And what did it symbolize? It symbolized the prayers 
that were offered up for God's people that ascended to heaven like a fragrant aroma. But then you would find something else, something that we might be more familiar with and, and that is super fascinating, and that's the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, a chest made of acacia wood that was only about four feet long and two feet high. You could probably fit it on this podium right here, this Ark of the Covenant. Now, it was covered with gold. You can see a theme here of just constant gold in all of these items. But what was it? Is It was the most sacred thing in the entire tabernacle, this Ark of the Covenant. And it was constructed in such a way that you could carry it without touching the base of the covenant. That's how sacred it was. But inside the Ark, it held what? The golden pot that had the manna that the Israelites ate in Exodus. It also had Aaron's rod or staff that budded that we see in Numbers chapter 17. And it also held the, uh, the tablets of the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments that Moses had on Mount Sinai. This ark held those things. But then on top was this thing called the mercy seat, which was the lid of this, cup, this, this uh, ark. And it was covered in gold. But what did it have on top? As you can see, these wings. And these wings were the wings of cherubim that would be spread and stretched upward and the faces toward each other and towards the mercy seat. When today we think about cherubim, what do we think about? Little fat little babies with wings, right? That we see on these cards. Now the Bible actually doesn't define cherubim like that. They're actually fearsome creatures. <laughs> but, uh, but wings spread out. And the Lord was said to appear in a cloud above the mercy seat. The Lord was said to appear above the cloud of the mercy seat of this Ark of the Covenant. And so why do I say all this? This one compartment of the tabernacle, this tent, the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant was to symbolize the actual throne of God. The very throne room of God in heaven. That's what this symbolized in this inner room. And so we have these different articles of the tabernacle, this earthly sanctuary of the Old Testament. All right. Let me, let me, let me attempt, if you might allow me, to read your minds a little bit. Right? These are fascinating things. I hear some ums, some ahs. Right? But you may be thinking, so what? <laughs> That's what I would be thinking. When I first read this, read this passage and looked at it at first glance, I mean, interesting, fascinating, these gold things that, that God set up. But I'm like, this is very tedious, and I don't know how this applies to me at all, <laughs> right? But then as I searched the scriptures and I dug into it, it fires me up. And it should fire us up too today. And we're going to talk about why that is. But it fires me up. And first of all, I think we need to understand that when we read things like this, the tabernacle, is that this tent was real. Can I get an amen? amen? This tabernacle was real. It was not an old wives' tale. Real people walked in here to do what God laid out for them thousands and thousands of years ago. This tabernacle, for some reason, this earthly sanctuary, was a part of God's plan, and it was real. And it had certain rituals. And what do I mean by that is, aside from the structure that I just laid out, what was it used for? <laughs> the sacrifices, right? What was it used for? I mean, that, that's, that's kind of what we got to ask ourselves to see how this applies to us. And so as we read through the scriptures in verses 1 through 10, it said, Every morning and every evening, the priests, the Levitical priests, would go into the holy place performing the service. Performing the service. And they would trim the lampstands and replace the olive oil and offer incense on the censer and replace the bread and, and, and pray for the people of God. But in verse 7, it said, In the second room, the inner room, the holy of holies, the high priest did not go with everyone else, but the high priest went alone once a year and not without blood. It says never without blood. And why was that? For the sacrifice. For the animal sacrifice to atone for the sins of the people. But it was very exclusive. It was a very exclusive process. I mean, just think about this guy. One man, once a year. 
And you want to know what? He entered this room terrified. Terrified of what was in there. And why was he terrified when he walked in there? Why? I mean, this seems pretty cool. But why is because he was entering into the very throne room of the living God. We don't know what that's like. <laughs> but he was entering into the very presence of God. And because of the overwhelming, uh, I talked about it a couple weeks ago when I, when I preached last, about this overwhelming power of God. Like you're looking at the sun, and you can't look at it, right? Because then you'll, you'll, you'll get blind because of the great power that it has, even though it provides such great light. But this overwhelming power of God, he, the priest, and everyone knew that he could be struck down dead at any moment in this inner room. So do you think that when he went in there one day a year, he went in there saying, finally, I'm in the presence of God, I love you, I'm here. And then he, he went on starting to sing worship songs. Do you think that was his mindset when he entered this room? No. In fact, I think it was the opposite. He, he had the sacrifices and he's, he's shaking. He's like, hey God, I have the sacrifices. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. Okay, bye, bye, bye. Terrified and, and shaking. It was in and out. And no one would walk in there for a whole year. The access to the Holy of Holies was restricted. And even when someone entered into it, it wasn't for sweet fellowship and communion, as was mentioned today, something that we get this morning, right? But in fact, it was more of a survival mission. Think about that. It was in and out. Simply surviving the experience. Now, I don't know about you, church. I'm going to speak for myself. But I don't want to live a life well, I am simply surviving the experience. I don't. I do not want to live a life like that. Why? Because it's so bleak. That's so exhausting. It's so purposeless. But I want to take it a step further and say that if you walk into a church service or some meeting of the body of believers and you're just trying to survive the experience, that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart, to enter into a meeting of the body of believers, and, your, and the mindset is just to survive this experience. We're shaking at our boots. We don't want to be here. And don't get me wrong, I mean, sometimes, I'll say a lot of times, life is hard, isn't it? And sometimes it feels like we're just trying to survive life. Can I get a raise of hands if it feels like you're just trying to survive life? Sometimes there's that old statement, hey, how you doing, man? Oh, I'm surviving. <laughs> okay. Good, that's good at least. And so if you just feel like you're trying to survive life and you don't know what to do, I want to be clear that you're in the right place. Can I get an amen? amen. But what I'm talking about is, is, is us trying to survive this. Survive this experience. And why does that break my heart? Is because that is not what God intended for us. For this meeting and these times to be, for the church to be a survival? No way. It's a thriving. But doing it together. Maybe you feel that way this morning. I know I appreciate the welcome and the communion. This is family. This North region is family. But maybe you feel that way this morning. That's how I used to feel as a kid going to church. So this is just a survival mission. <laughs> just in and out. Right? Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be here. Not, and not because I felt like I was literally going to die. Like the high priest, even though I probably said that. Oh, I'm going to die. What has Zevin done? What is this sermon over? But not because of that. No. Why was it, though? It's because I wasn't sure if this really was a sanctuary. I was unsure as a kid. This is church, right? Is this really a sanctuary, though? Am I actually safe here? Is it actually peaceful? Do I actually find refuge and protection? Do I actually face no judgment? 
Am I actually wanted here? Guys, I yearn for this church. I yearn for the, the, the Greater Philadelphia Church of Christ, for this region, for the North region, for the youth ministry and our devotionals, for the children's ministry to be a place that is consistently including and not excluding. That is a place of inclusion and not exclusion. Would any type of person, this has been on my heart, would any type of person feel welcomed and loved walking through these doors? Or at our various functions? Any type of person, guys. Not just us, who knows what the vibes are, but any type of person, any culture, any walk of life, any age. We have our different regions and different locations, and I get it, there's different surroundings, different cultures, but we're God's church. We're God's church, amen? amen? Now, it's not that we settle for sin, but as imperfect people, we help each other find sweet fellowship and communion with the Almighty God. That in these moments, in these spaces, we don't have to walk on eggshells, but we get to pour out our hearts genuinely in these times and get to a place where we mean the words we say when we sing songs together. Now that's something that means a lot to me and that's a big way I connect with God is singing to God. But as we sang the song Sanctuary, listen to these words. Oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary that is pure and that is holy. Tried and true, with thanksgiving, I will be a living sanctuary for you, God. That's powerful. Well, we sing these songs a lot, but that's powerful. And I want to be clear. I and I I, I echo the, uh, Jermaine and Dave. I'm really proud of of you guys, of this family, of this church. What I'm not saying is you guys are terrible at this. But I see, I'm saying sometimes we need to check ourselves. Because yeah. we can get into the hustle bustle and get comfortable. Yeah. And we are imperfect people, aren't we? Yeah. And we have limitations. And so do earthly sanctuaries. And so as we move on, let's talk about the earthly sanctuary symbolism. Let's go back to the tabernacle. And maybe what can be limiting now about this process. I'm going to reread verses 9 through 10. It says, this, all that I've read, this is an illustration for what? The present time. Indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to be clear, were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. In other words, the tabernacle and all it represented in the old covenant was like a symbol and parable of the new covenant that we are under today. Right. All of it was beautiful. The gold, everything. It was, it was fascinating. It was rich in meaning. And again, if you dive deeper, you'll see how awesome it is. But the tabernacle's limitation was present. The tabernacle was limited. You want to know why the tabernacle was limited? It's because it didn't usher people into the presence of God. Not in, a, not in a good way. <laughs> and so what's the point? What's the big idea this morning is that God wanted to take them past the first room of rituals, of symbols and ceremonies, and bring them into the actual presence of him. And he did that by the new covenant. And church, he wants to do the same for you. He wants to do the same for you this morning, each and every one of you. I mentioned church services. Now with all that being said, let's, let's be real for a second. What we come here to do, right, again on Sunday mornings, they can seem like religious rituals, can it? Like where, where, do you, where do we find these specific processes in the scriptures, right? They can seem like religious rituals. But here we are, right? Gathered together at a certain hour, 1030 at a certain place, worshiping God together and praying together and tithing together and celebrating together and, and hearing God's word together. These are rituals. These are religious rituals. 
But I don't say that in a derogatory way. I don't say that in a derogatory way. Because I believe, church, that the value of these rituals is found in us leading each other into real fellowship with God. What do I mean by that? Is church is crucial. Church is crucial. There might be some of you in the audience that don't feel that way. Shoot, I mean, we all the letters that we've looked at through Paul as a church, I feel like that's the common theme. It's like, what are you guys doing? Stick together. This is what you need. The community of believers. Church is crucial, and I believe that. However, church, if it's just the rituals or ceremonies or traditions or the building, then they have very little meaning, do they? What are we even doing here? What am I doing up here? What are we singing these songs for if it's just rituals? I wonder if coming to church for some of you, or I'll just say the things that you do in your Christian life, if there are simply religious rituals that you perform at this point, or whether it's really the intent of bringing you into the fellowship of the true living God. Is that, what it, is that what this is for you? Communication with a living God that is really there. He's really there. And he wants to connect with you from heaven. And I, and I can be bold to say that if you don't have that, you're missing out. If you don't have that connection with God, you're missing out. I'm just going to say it. Why? Because God created you, Dave said it, God created you to have a relationship with Him. He's our creator. We're not in control. He created us to have a relationship with Him. And this is what we want to help us to do together. Together. That's why we do this. Because we need help. Because we're imperfect, right? We're imperfect. I'm not perfect. Now as a minister, this is something I can struggle with is I can't make you have communion with God. Can I? I can't force you to do that. We can't force each other to do that. I can't preach a sermon good enough to make that happen for you. As, as much as that pains me. <laughs> These sermons won't do it all the time. That's true. <laughs> but, however, however, through the worship of God, collectively, right? Through, through the prayer of God's people that we lift up, and focusing on His Word, and encouraging one another daily, that it does provide an atmosphere that hopefully breaks down the walls that we can build, and in turn makes it a little easier for us to enter into the presence of God, and instead say, yes, God, I love you. I'm here to connect with you, and I know you want that as well. That's the goal. That's the goal. But we've got to have, I believe we've got to have grace on ourselves. We've got to have grace on ourselves because we're imperfect. And you want to know what? This earthly sanctuary has limitations too. Because you know what? While I, while I would say the church is a far better sanctuary than the tabernacle that I just described. Yeah. By far. It still has its limitations, doesn't it? Just as Walter talked about last week, that we can make less than perfect spiritual promises, our spiritual sanctuaries here on earth can still be less than perfect sanctuaries. I think that's fair to say. But it's Jesus, it's always Jesus, who's simply better, who brings about a fuller worship that is the best sanctuary for us as worshipers. And what am I talking about, church? Let's keep reading in verse 11 through 12 as we round out here. What is this leading to, this better sanctuary? In verse 11 it says, But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is what? Not made with human hands. That is to say, is not even a part of this creation. In verse 12, He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place, the holy of holies, once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. What have I been getting at this whole time? We have, we have earthly sanctuaries that are far better than the tabernacle of old because of Jesus. But that is not the best sanctuary. 
The best sanctuary that we're ever going to find is the eternal sanctuary. The best sanctuary that we're going to find is the eternal sanctuary. Do you guys know what that is? Heaven. That is heaven. The author is now calling us to a heavenly reality. That what was on earth with the tabernacle, yeah, that was great. It was material. It really was real and it existed. And the regulation served God's purpose for those people at the specific time. However, there is another temple that is just as real. There's another temple that is just as real, but, but you can't see it because it's in heaven. And it's greater. And it's a perfect tabernacle. Why? Because God made it. It's not made with human hands. It's a true holy of holies in a room that literally takes us into the presence of God. That is where God ultimately wants to bring you. Guys, I'm not getting much. Do you guys understand that we're going to be with God in heaven one day? Yeah. Literally in his presence. That is, I don't even know if I can process that right now. Because I'm trying to fire all of us up. That is something we believe, right? Oh my goodness, right? It is now as I showed you pictures at the beginning of the earthly tabernacle, I can't show you pictures of heaven. I don't have any pictures of heaven to try to inspire us. Right? But what I can tell you is that it is real. Heaven is real. And you might be saying, you don't how can you say that? That's very confident of you. You've never been there. But how can I say that? It's for two reasons. Heaven is real because you want to know what the word of the, the word of God describes it as the reality of heaven. God describes it and promises it in his word, in the Bible. It's real. We don't believe the Bible is a fairy tale, do we? So we sure don't believe heaven is a fairy tale. There's a heaven where God really dwells. And Jesus is at his right hand at the throne of God. Do you believe that? I know we can't see it, but God's word says it is a reality, and therefore we should rejoice, and that should give us faith, because faith comes from hearing the message, isn't it? As Charles Spurgeon said, when we speak about heaven, we need to let our faces reflect the glory of God. That should radiate some type of energy when we talk about heaven. But then he goes on to say, when you, when you speak of hell, your ordinary expression will do. That's fine. But we're talking about heaven. Does that fire you up? Does that excite you? There is a heaven. Because the Bible says there is. And it's in God's word. Secondly, I, I feel like I can say that there's a heaven because deep down you know that there is in your heart. And what do I mean by that? Let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Where it says, we talk about this, where it says, God has placed eternity in the human heart. He's placed eternity in our hearts. And there's a void and a space deep down where you know it to be true. Even if you're trying to go about your life trying to suppress it and deny it. I imagine there's that nagging feeling where you're like, man, but what if there is? <laughs> I know that's got to be true. God is saying here that because of the new covenant that he has put in place, Jesus has torn that veil that separates the two rooms. And he has given us in turn access to connect with God and be with him in heaven one day. Amen. This makes it all worth it. <laughs> Even what we're doing here. This may sound like a hot take, but I praise God that our earthly sanctuaries like church isn't all we have to look forward to with our salvation. If this was it, I love y'all. I love y'all. But if this was it, man, you know what I'm saying? You don't want to hear me preach all the time. You know that for a fact. But we have a better sanctuary. And what is that? Is that's the eternal sanctuary. Jesus' own house is what God has for us to experience and enter in the presence of him. So as I close, 
read the scripture in the back. I'm not going to read it. But my encouragement is don't let heaven be far from your speech this week. Talk about it with others. This eternal sanctuary. Let it fire you up. Pray about it. Meditate on it. And may it give you hope this week. That there are better things to come. And that's a promise if, 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 we, if we stay true to God and remain faithful. But maybe most of all this morning, church, is my challenge and encouragement to us is may we all not just live our lives just familiar with these rituals and doing religious things, but instead let us strive to live our lives to experience true connection with the living God. That is the gift that we've been given in this new covenant. The joy of an eternal sanctuary that awaits. Amen? And so, as the singers come on out, we're going to sing one more song. We're going to sing a song called Home in Heaven. <laughs> now, I, I, I put this in place for a purpose because this is a song that we sing a lot. <laughs> and maybe you're tired of the song. No. No way. That's good. Sometimes I do, I'll confess. But, I want to read the lyrics to you guys. And hopefully as we sing it now together, it, it, it hits a little more deep than maybe in times past. And so, here are the lyrics. It says, I've got a home. I've got a crown. I've got a love that will never let me down. I've got a home and I've got a prize that he will wipe away the tears from my eyes. I've got a home that is forever to stay. I've been forgiven. I am on my way. I've got a home. I've got his grace. And I will see my Lord face to face. I've got a home, even though I once was lost, but Jesus, he found me that blood on the cross. I've got a home that I get to share. And I've got a promise, and it's that I will see you there. In heaven, in heaven, we have got a home in heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's stand on up and sing this final song together.